Ooh. Hello, hello. Yeah, as Robert mentioned, today we're going to talk about visual unit tests and how to make fast and robust visual unit tests for your React application. Uh, but before we start, let me introduce myself and give you a bit of background. Why do we use them? So my name is Denis, not Dianis, but because of Belarusian transliteration, you can see various variants, but I'm Denis. And I'm senior software engineer and active open source contributor. Um, I'm from Minsk, now based in London, and work for a really cool company, The Zone. Any one of you guys heard something about The Zone? Nice, so many people in Minsk, so I, no one. <laughs> but yeah, for others, The Zone doesn't operate in UK so far. Uh, but if you are a football or boxing fan like me, I'm pretty sure you have seen at least logo. The Zone is an OTT platform. It's kind of Netflix of sports. Uh, we are available so far in nine countries, such as United States, Canada, Italy, Germany, Japan, etc. We have hundreds of developers and millions of customers. And what's important, we are available on more than 30 types of devices, such as various smart TVs, uh, mobiles and tablets, laptops, game consoles like Xbox and PS4. And now, Let's try to identify what visual unit tests are. And we can start from general purpose of UI testing. So general purpose of visual UI testing is to verify that the user interface is rendered correctly based on some baseline image. And in most cases, such tests work in a way that uh, they open sort web, web page, trying to get needed states through some page interactions like clicks, scrolls, etc. then doing a screenshot, comparing this screenshot with some sort of baseline image. And many QAs and developers use them as a plugin for their end-to-end -end tests, which is nice, but there is a problem. End-to-end -end tests are expensive and flaky by nature. You need to have a run server for front-end, for back-end. Depends on your architecture. It can be really tricky in some cases. Plus, uh, interactions can take a while. So today, we're going to learn how to do it on a unit, or probably you can call it like integration level, but which is important, without server at all, and only based on the server-side rendering with some sort of predefined states. OK? So, as I said, at the zone, we do support of many types of devices. It's probably answer why do we need these tests at all. But I have a question for you guys. Let's say that we have one feature which has uh, three UI states. Like, quite simple example. What do you think? How many tests we need in this case? Uh, to make it easier, I will give you a small example from one of our features. It's called standings. So as you can see, it's just a table of uh, football matches with some sort of visual representations. There are quite a small differences. But yeah, it's just three types of the representation of the same table. So any ideas how many tests we need to do manually or automatically? 10, 20, 30, 40 ideas. Three. Good. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. So 147. As we have a three right states, but we also have a three, six, we do support six breakpoints for our web application. Fortunately, for TV applications, we do support only of one breakpoint, which is scaled later on. But it multiplies by the number of our languages. In our case, it's seven languages, so 147. And as you can imagine, it will take quite a while, right, for manual regression. That's why, basically, we definitely need some sort of tool with a short development feedback loop to be confident that we do our visual changes correctly and not breaking anything in the production. On this slide, you can see a few examples of uh, components which my team working on. And we can continue. So just any one of you guys heard something about this tool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So just itself is pretty good test runner. Uh, it's fast. It's robust. Uh, I don't see any reasons why to not use it for visual tests or for any tests in general. Uh, but there is one missed part. Uh, so for our end-to-end -end tests, we usually have a nice reports, either Allure, either others. But for unit tests, we're mostly checking everything in the code calf or some sort of console output. 
I don't know. That's why, and it's okay, right? Uh, it's okay for unit tests, but it's definitely won't work for visual stuff. That's why one of the first requirements were to implement some sort of reporter. And let me introduce uh, my open source project, which called Jest Allure, uh, which made Jest with Allure and help you to integrate nice reports for any of your tests. Doesn't matter, is it visual unit, whatever. Please feel free to check it out. It's available on GitHub and NPM. And give me feedback. I appreciate it. So now, to make presentation more interactive, I just prepared a small demo, demo project. I probably was really angry because I just did this like application with three tabs, uh, just hot dog, burger, tacos, some text, some SVGs, uh, some visual stuff, basically. Uh, but once we have an application, we're ready to start to implement visual unit tests and break it. So, but you know, like right now, to do something cool, we really need to be prepared, right? At least like this guy from the video, especially with uh, this coronavirus, etc. We need to have respirator, <laughs> all this stuff. Um, so let's make a plan in advance and talk what we're gonna do. In a common scenario, tests open the component in predefined state and then take a screenshot. This will require us to develop component in a way that one, uh, that the same inputs should produce, basically same as a pure function, same input should produce the same output constantly. Uh, and what we're gonna do, we're gonna generate a markup with styles of our component, then we're gonna load it to the browser, then we're gonna make a screenshot, compare it somehow, and if there is something, uh, make, uh, differ, generate a diff basically, and add it back to the reporter. And to help you get a full picture of what we are trying to achieve, let's do a presentation in a bit reverse way. So, and start from the small demo. So far, it's too early to dig into the implementation. Let's just consider the fact that we have a three tests, we run them first time. We should generate a baseline image. They should pass. We expect that. And as you can see, they generate a baseline image for us. And this baseline image we're going to use as a reference during few further comparisons. OK? PNG. Um, now, once we have uh, baseline images, we're going to be able to do some differences. So let's change uh, just a hot dog to just a visual unit test. Uh, here, I'm going to do freeform translation from English to Russian. Taka going to be Mexican shawarma, whatever it means. Um, later on, we're going to change. Um, yeah, let's do a change for our bugger and change the color of the bottom slice from yellow to white. So. Cool. As you can see, now it's white. And we can run our tests again and see if they're going to fail or not. We expect that they should fail, right? So here we go. They failed. And now we're able to run a reporter and check the results. As we spot all the differences or not. So, oops. As you can see in the reporter for burger, we spot our difference with the color change. We also spot the difference with the text change, was translated. And just a hot dog now become a, just a visual unit as cool. So to achieve that, we're gonna use a bunch of plugins. And just, we already covered Puppeteer, who worked with Puppeteer before. Okay, so. Cool. For everyone else, uh, it's don't worry. It's just a tiny node library, or not so tiny, but uh, provides high-level API to control Chrome, Chromium and Firefox. Um, we're going to use just Allure as a reporter, as I already mentioned. Just environment puppeteer JSDOM needed, as we're going to do server-side rendering based on JSDOM. Plus, we're going to use just Allure image snapshots. It's a tiny library. It's mostly based on pixel match, but we never go into pixel by pixel comparison during comparison of uh, during during test itself. We go in, into pixel by pixel comparison only du 
during generation of the difference. I will uh, explain it a bit later. So uh, now let's move to the configuration. Uh, we found it useful to have a different configuration for unit and visual tests. Uh, first of all, it makes things clear and looks everything nicer, and we have a good separation of concerns. So on the screenshot, you can see file structure on the configuration, which we use. And everything starts from the just config.js. And on the next line, like sort line, you can see CSS model processor. It's a tricky one. If you use CSS models as we use them, uh, you need to provide correct mapping for your styles. That's the reason why this file is here. Plus, a uh, global setup file, which is responsible for running the Puppeteer instance and transpiling of our post CSS. Uh, teardown, like just a one liner, is responsible for closing Puppeteer instance itself. Setup test environment is responsible for registration of our plugins, such as just Allure, just Allure image snapshot, and Zyme if you use it. And as you can see, for test rejects extension, we specify a new one, dot visual, dot test, dot JS to define like visual and unit tests separately. So, and for test environment, we just using plugin, which we have already installed. Um, now let's go file by file and check out what we have there. So setup test environment, as I mentioned, here we do registration of plugins, like just a little image snapshot plus enzyme. Uh, global setup is, First purpose of this file is definitely to call setup of the puppeteer. This function have imported from our dependencies. Second is to prepare our styles. And it's a bit tricky. If you're using less or SCSS, you need this function, but don't worry. Transpiling of styles, it's not a complicated job. It's basically three lines of code. Doesn't matter which preprocessor you're looking for. Here, as you can see, we just importing post CSS. Plus, we importing our configuration, which we also shared with our Webpack configuration. But if you use plain CSS or any CSS and JS libraries, you find you even don't need it. So we can go later. And you know what? We're almost done. We're almost done with our setup. So, but still, somewhere in our code, uh, we need to have few util functions. And this util function, which is going to be responsible to take a screenshot, to set viewport in the correct viewport, which we're expecting later on, and later on return the screenshots. Honestly, in the production, we also have here some debug information, how to store this, uh, how to store uh, HTML, which is going to be generated for this function, but yeah, it's a bit out of scope. And now you can see a few examples of tests based on our real tests. I just clean them a bit. Basically, in the zone, we're using Mobux State 3 and React as a main flow for our front end. So in common scenarios, such tests looking uh, like this. We just mock in some responses from our server because it's mostly server-driven server application. And in some cases, you can have also enzyme here and do interactions like clicks or whatever to get needed states of your component. But yeah, generally, it looks like this. And now it's time to talk about the performance. Because performance, it's a crucial part about anything what you're going to add to you or what you're going to plan to add to your development pipeline, right? Because if it's going to be too long or it's going to be flaky, you will never add it. Oh, it's going to be, at least it's going to be useless. So as you can see, in our case, uh, main time consumer, it's server-side rendering itself. Uh, server-side rendering plus, pl plus screenshot takes about 350 milliseconds, but it's with a complicated DOM structure. It really depends on your DOM structure and how nested your components are. Um, in case of demo application, it takes much less. It's about 150 milliseconds, but this result is uh, taken from production. Comparing of two equal images, which is really nice one. I really like this number because it takes less than one milliseconds. And asterisk sign here, you can see it, right? So it's worth to mention, you never get such value if you will go with a pixel by pixel comparison, or even if you go with a zone comparison. 
you will never get such value. This value you're able to achieve only if you comparing buffers. So I'm talking about just buffers dot equals JavaScript API. If you're able to produce totally same buffer, you're able to compare it less than a milliseconds. And this is one of the most important thing one we why we use Puppeteer. Uh, we cover it a bit later as well. Generation of the diff. Here it's a bit tricky. So far, we're doing the generation of our difference on a node process, and it takes a while. And it actually takes up to three seconds for images uh, 800 to 600, which means about 35 seconds uh, for 100 images on my mark, which is not too bad, but it can be improved. We even can think about to move this functionality to later on to a reporter itself, but so far it's done in node process. Uh, comparison generation of 100 screenshots takes up to 20 seconds. So, yeah, it's quite fast. And as I already mentioned, we use Puppeteer. Basically, it means we have two options out of the box, Chrome and Firefox. And uh, why Puppeteer? Because it's fast, it's robust, and it's which, what is more important, it's able to produce totally same buffer for the different screenshot sessions of the same element. And it's a crucial thing. But it doesn't mean that you can't use such tests in another browser. Uh, with browser stack and WebDriver IO, you can. And I actually raised a pull request, and you can check it out and see how you're able to integrate such tests with the browser stack. But you just need to keep in mind that it takes your pipeline longer. Plus, if you're going to run your tests on, a, let's say, iOS device, like iPhone, you will get a screenshot with the battery status and with the time. And for that, you're going to need to introduce excluded zone, either like cut your image. But yeah, it's just a bit tricky. And it definitely take longer. Now uh, you can see how we have it integrated into the zone. So for each PR, we receiving nice commit for every push with all our tests and with all reporters. And for visual, as you can see, we're getting reporter for web TV and common tests. And today, I'm going to talk to you how to do the same. But in the zone, we're using drone as a CI provider. I'm going to cover how to do it with the Circle CI. I like Circle CI because it's a free from open source project. It's quite configurable. And they do support of, and they even provide a lot of Docker images, which I really enjoy. So pipeline itself is quite simple. We just need to create a config YAML file uh, and define our first job. It can be built. You can call it test, whatever. In our case, we call it tests. Then we specify uh, Docker image, which we're going to use. I uh, specified Circle CI node with latest browser. Of course, in the production, it makes sense to lock your node version with a 10, 12, whatever you use. But I mean, for demo purposes, it doesn't require it. Then in step sections, as you can see, we're doing checkout, then installing our reporter, installing our dependencies, and running tests. Basically, that's it. And only on failure, we generate a report. Fair to mention that we find out that it works to generate report even for past tests, because there are some cases when you're developing new functionality, you're developing new components. And it's good if you have a report with the images, how your components looks like for other developers, because during review, they're able just to open reporter and check it out. It's much nicer and easier workflow for them. Once we set up the pipeline, we have a first problem. If we try to run it, we will face that our screenshot is going to be a bit different, a bit different on the Linux, which is provided by CircleCI. And uh, at least on my Mac and on their Linux machine, it's going to be quite simple differences. But you even probably won't be able to cut it with the eye, right? But still, tests able to cut it. Uh, Hopefully, there are at least few ways how to fix it. Any ideas? Cool. As I said, there are a few ways. Always run tests in a Docker container, which is a great option. And if you have a simple architecture or if you have a 
easy way how to do that. It's definitely way to go. With the Circle CI, they introduced a local execution command. So basically, you can, in your terminal, run just a Circle CI local execute, then name of your command, and basically will pick up your config YAML file, read it through, and run all the command which you mentioned. And it's like one of the best choices. But if you're not fan of the to having running Docker instance only for your tests, or let's say you have a complicated architecture and it's just not possible by some reason, you can stick with another way and consider CI as a single source of truth. <laughs> it's actually what we are doing, and I will explain how it works. So basically, with the CI as a single source of truth, we have a two folders, local and CI. And we once we're running tests locally, we're running them against local baseline images, which means we, we have a bit more flexibility because we able even compare our images from one branch to another branch. Doesn't matter was it merged to master or not. And only on CI, in this case, we able to update these images. It's not possible to do it locally. So for that, we basically need to update our configuration a bit. And during registration of our image snapshot, we're going to specify then if tests going to be run on the CI, we're going to store them in the CI folder. If they're going to be run on the local, in the local folder. And only CI folder is committed under the Git LFS. So, but in this case, we need to train CI how to update such screenshots. It's actually quite useful because you even can do it from your mobile phone without any access to laptop. And for that, in the circle CI, let's just add a new command. Uh, let's call it update snapshot uh, camel case. So here we just installing dependencies again, running our test, we passing minus u flag. And then, as you can see, we configuring Git a bit and committing our changes back to our branch. And later on, we just need to run it somehow. For in the zone, we're using a drone command, drone deploy command, because like we found that it's only one thing which works with drone nicely. With the circle size, there is another way. They have approval jobs. Uh, approval jobs is uh, such type of jobs which are going to be run it only in case if someone with needed credential approves them manually. So to implement such approval job, we need to make a few changes. We basically need to register a new job, update snapshot question mark. So yeah, we have update snapshot camel case. And this update snapshot camel case need to require another job, update snapshot question mark. And update snapshot question mark is an empty job, but just have a type approval. And I will show you how it works in a minute. So now, once we've done these changes, we test it locally, let's push, let's push these changes to the branch and see how it works on the CI. So I just push them, creating a pull request. Here we go. And I'm, yeah, build started. I'm expecting that build should fail. So once pipeline failed, we can check reporter in artifacts. Yeah, it's all our steps. We're installing reporter. We can see that tests are failed. Plus, in the circle CI, in the top, it's going to be attached our reporter again. I also added a few more tests on a unit level. So previously, we able to see yeah this like the whole kind of whole application, which is quite useful sometimes. Let's see. But we also able to integrate it only for some of components. And in this case, I integrated to the bottom bar, which has a small difference as we change the burger and burger used in the bottom bar as well. So, but for uh, top component, nothing changed and it passed. And if, in case, if it's new functionality and we agree with such changes, we need to approve them. We can approve it with approval job. And once we click approve, it's going to run a new job, update snapshot question, uh, camel case in this case, because update snapshot question mark going to be approved. And this update snapshot camel case going to run a new pipeline and going to update our snapshots. It will take us about, I believe, 20 seconds. So let's just be patient a bit. <laughs> So 
So we're running tests. And yeah, as we can see, tests passed this time, and they pushed new images. Now we can go back to the GitHub and check are they updated or not. And you can also spot that build job triggered again, which is makes sense. So yeah, new commit is here. And in a file differences, we able to see that our images also were added. Let me open them. Yeah, as you can see, new images were added, which means next tests, once this pull request is going to be merged to master, will be compared with set images. Um, and I want to congrats you, because we did it. Uh, we did a real pipeline with visual unit tests. But before we end, I would like to share some kind of pro tips or Easter eggs, which we found during development of such tests. Because some of them really complex to spot, but really easy to fix. And if your component contains animation or transitions, it can be complicated to get the same screenshot during the, during the movement, right? So we need to disable animation. There are also another way. If you do JavaScript animation or like some imperative animations and you have a control over them, you can even test the such animations. Even with CSS animation, you're also able to test them. But question is, do you need it? If you need, then like it's able with a Puppeteer API. But in case if you don't care about the animation during just a screenshot session, simplest way is just to disable them. As you can see here, I'm disabling all transitions, plus we disable in correct colors. It's when we have a focus and input field and this straight line all the time highlighted, and really annoying, but it fails our <laughs> visual tests. So plus, you should remember that only for web, we do support of six breakpoints, right? Plus, we're supporting multiple type of languages. And to follow dry principles and prevent copy-paste, uh, it was to create a helper functions which going to generate tests for us. And basically, this function can, be, can look similar to this one. We just have a helper function create visual tests, get, which create a double array through our languages and through our breakpoints and generate and generates a new describe block and then pass to our it callback dimensions and language. And based on the information from this slide and information on that slide with a final look how our test gonna looks like in the like in the real world, uh, may I ask you how many tests we have implemented here? So we have two tests. Previously, we have some magic with the breakpoints and languages. Two tests plus two breakpoints plus three languages, 12, because we need to multiply them. <laughs> but yeah. So basically, in a such simple way, we implemented just 12 tests is awesome and guys thank you so much uh if you have any questions please don't hesitate to grab me here i will be around and code available on the github so please feel free to check it out thank you